It's time. You know what time it is. I've talked about every other car on the planet. Haven't even really talked about my own car. So it's time to discuss the Black Edition. Let's go. I'm ready. Okay, uh, where do we start? We start 2016. Back in 2016, World Championships in Vegas, I ran the prototype parts that became the Black Edition. That, th that race didn't go too well for me. I didn't really have my car dialed in yet, to be honest. And uh, I broke in my quarterfinal. I had a good chance of bumping to the semifinal, but I, I wouldn't have made the main, no way. I, the best I could have done is finish like bottom half of the semifinal. So I wasn't stoked, let's put it that way. Fast forward 2017, early 2017, finally all the parts were ready. I had figured out the setup. I was pretty happy, car was good. Velocity RC did a review. March 2017. I actually went back and referenced the last time I drove his car on the review and what I wrote. And the new car is radically different from what I remember. His other car was very twitchy off center. This one is very natural. It steers, it turns in, and it hangs on to the corner. If you stay in the traction, it creates a smooth arcing turn and doesn't kind of snap oversteer or understeer in that fact. It's pretty neutral. The bigger thing to me was watching the car. It looks natural on the track. It looks like it's an athlete. It's a good car. As you heard, it's a good car. We can end the video right there. No, well, the thing is that, let's go back a bit. The original car was released 2010, December 2010. Pretty quickly, like six months later, we had to fix some issues with the original plastics which were weak they were too weak they broke so we fixed that there was a few other parts like main gears and something else we had to fix so six months later we have a new version then um i think 2012 we released the yellow edition which was the first slightly bigger update to the original car and then 2013 was a big update we went to a wide chassis and different shock towers longer arms um, different hubs major change and that that was a really good step forward big step forward i would say that original car was quite twitchy and nervous the reason was that when i first designed it i didn't really know what i was doing to be honest i mean i had all these ideas and I just wanted to make the fastest car possible, the car with the most potential to go fast. And I did achieve that in a sense, but the problem was that it was too hard to drive and it, you could do it for one lap, like amazing lap, but you couldn't do it for five minutes. Like you would just hit something less than perfect on the track and it would punish you because it was so sensitive. It didn't have a comfort zone. And that had to do with many different things, that geometry and how narrow it was and, and all that stuff. But it was actually good that I started that way because every part of the car, I had to learn to understand why it wasn't working how I wanted. And then bit by bit, I figured out what I wanted to do. Now, some of my friends just said, like, why don't you just copy the Kyosho? Because back then the Kyosho was the best car. Basically, they just won the Worlds 2010. MP9 was a really good platform back then. I mean, it still would be. Uh, but I, I wasn't really interested in that because I wanted to understand what I was doing. If I made a change to the car, I wanted to know exactly why I was doing it and why that way I had it now wasn't as good. So it took time. But anyway, so three years later, from 2010 to 2013, we released the white edition and that was a whole new platform started developing that and uh, i saw that there was a lot of room to improve but then around 2015 2016 i saw that okay we, we really need to make some more bigger changes to be able to improve further so then 2016 developed the black edition 2017 early in the year 
we released it. Actually, let's go and check some pictures and release information on that. Okay, so black is the new white. This was kind of a Facebook promotion uh, marketing campaign we had. We were changing the cover cover photos on there. So it started black is the new white April 1st. Well, because we were going from the white edition to the black edition. Pretty simple. And April 1st, it's always been a date that we release stuff, release new cars, websites, all because it's a joke. <laughs> That's why. Uh, some quotes. Although I drive an HB, I will get one of your new cars just to show support of your wonderful dream. And this guy actually did get one of, of the black editions. It doesn't even run the black editions. <laughs> so black edition, it's longer. That's what they say. In this case, the chassis was longer. We lengthened the chassis four mil in the rear and just more corner speed actually. Yes, the wheelbase is longer, but also the, the weight distribution is more to the front of the car. So it was good change. It's time for a new beginning. Yes, it really, it felt like a new beginning with the black edition because it was such a, like a reset in many ways. The car was much better. It again had a lot more potential and around this time there were just a lot of changes going on in the company and our position in the market. So exciting times. Uh, who cares? You will only be in business for one more year anyway. This was uh, Tyler Prick at uh, Argentina Worlds. Ironically, he was only around for one more year. So I'm still here eight years later. It's because your car is a piece of shit. Well, we all know this, the infamous Savoia quote. That was the same race. Then Degani, I don't know how JQ managed to make such a good car because he is an idiot. This is a legitimate quote. He said this uh, probably more than once. This is the best car we, we have ever made. I mean, factual statement by almost diploma engineer Joseph Coigrain. Almost because I dropped out, actually. I, I did all the courses I want. I didn't really do that. I, I don't do anything the conventional way, let's face it. So I was studying mechanical engineering and I wanted to do product development as my major. But to get in there, you had to have all your basic courses done and you had to have good grades and progress and stuff because so many people want to do it. So they couldn't accept everyone. Well, you know me, I didn't do all the basic courses because some of them, like we have maths one, two, three, and it's really complicated. So I did one and then I'm like, I'm never going to need, if one is like this, I'm definitely never going to need two or three. Skip that. Uh, so, same with some other courses. Just I'm like never ever going to do anything like this. Not, not bothering. And instead what I did was I would take courses that interested me and I thought could be helpful for me. So I didn't get into the product development major. Now, when you do that as a major, you can pick industrial design from another school as your minor. Well, I did it. I applied anyway. And I just said that I don't have my major yet. It's going to be uh, verified or like selected in the spring. And th I was applying to start in that other school in the autumn. So they accepted me. So I, I, I started doing my minor uh, industrial design and I did that. And for product development, even though I wasn't accepted into that major program, I, I could still do the courses. I could sit in on the classes. So I basically, I did it. I finished my minor, all good. I did all the courses for my major. And then I went to the professor and said, so I wasn't accepted into this major, but I've basically done it now. So can you accept me? And because the last course was this like big product development project. And if I remember correctly, it was only open to the actual students of that major. So, but I basically had done it, the, the whole course. So I was then accepted and I could do that final course. And then that's, that was fine. But I didn't get my diploma because of some basic courses that I never did. So I didn't even get a bachelor's degree. I got no degree actually. But I, the amount of courses I did is the same as you would do for a master's degree. It's just that I picked courses that interested me and I feel were helpful for me. So what do I do with that piece of paper? Nothing. I, I went to school for 
the knowledge and uh, learning what I needed. I don't care about the diploma. My parents disagree, but you know, we have a lot of disagreements with my parents. Let's just w add one more. Okay, so what's new on the Black Edition? Here's all the parts that were updated. And it doesn't really seem like that much. Nothing in the middle is changed, but hey, chassis. We Will we already at the three mil chassis? No, I don't think so. So uh, the Black Edition, we changed to a three mil chassis, I believe. So that's a pretty big thing. And also it was four mil longer at the back. Arms were the same, but we went to harder arms. So same geometry, just harder arms for the Black Edition. Then we have these carbon plates that we place under the gearboxes and they raise the gearbox uh, two mil. Now the reason for this was that this is basically a gypsy's way of adjusting diff height. Now we didn't make new gearboxes. To raise the gearbox we placed this carbon shim between the chassis and the gearbox. Raise it two mil. But when we do that we have to then readjust the arm holders A, B, C, D blocks to lower them back down because these are attached to the gearbox and we don't want to raise them two mil. So raise the gearbox lower that arm back down. Same for the towers, front and rear. So we lowered the link holes, adjusted the geometry a bit too, the roll centers a bit, and then the shock holes also. Then due to the new chassis, we needed a new rear brace. Now again, we didn't make a mold, which would have been the best thing to do, but we couldn't at that point in time. So we made a CNC rear brace. Now not perfect, but it's okay. It, uh, it does the job. Then we needed a longer dog bone in the rear, obviously. Nice skid plate. This is a really good feature, I think, because especially on American tracks, the, many of the jump faces are really like sandpaper. And even, let's say, Thunder Alley, one day at the track, if you run it dry, can ruin a chassis. Just one day. So a skid plate, a skid plate is super nice, especially on a three mil chassis like this. So you just keep changing the skid plate and you extend the life of your chassis a lot. And the skid plate is also, uh, it's not on the chassis, it's in it. It's machined into it. There's a name for this. Like a pocket is machined and it's flush with the chassis. I can't think what the term is for that. But anyway, you get the point. Uh, what else? Uh, then we have uh, the hinge pins also because the hinge pins were too hard in the white edition so they would break so we changed them they were slightly softer now so since then we don't break hinge pins sometimes they can bend but you can always finish the race so it's better than snapping them and not being able to finish the steering changed what changed on the steering i can't even remember anymore ah oh, we improved the bushings a bit but still they even now they are they wear out too quick so the steering is definitely something we need to update it's just it wears out too quickly and this plate had to be changed because the gearbox was raised so there's a step in it and then we also adjusted the knuckle and c hub c hub i think we just released new c hubs with 18 and 20 degrees caster we had 15 and 16 on the the white edition so we went to 18 and 20 degrees also we changed the knuckle so we had these uh steering plates so carbon steering plates on so we can adjust Ackerman and we added some inclination just a few degrees I, I can't reveal the amount of degrees because Torrance de Guzman from HB he wanted to know and I'm not telling him that's the only reason so I can't <laughs> I can't let you know how many degrees it's a few degrees okay so the standard we have standard ones with zero and then the black edition came came stock in the beginning at least with these inclined ones. What else? Okay, of course, the Black Edition also came with a new body. So that sort of J Concepts style body, which was really popular at the time and still is. I, I, I like this kind of look for the body the best. I think it looks nice. Okay, what else? Well, the first 500 cars of the Black Edition had this special laser engraving on the chassis. I, I hope I saved one because I think it looks nice. Every, obviously everything's very black. So yep, four mil longer dog bone. 
this was a printing mistake it is a, or laser engraving mistake it's actually 18 and here you see we have different plates now for the knuckles we're going to talk about them soon so here you see a two mil riser plate also here under the brace now here you see actually the the skid plate how it's done so just keep changing the skid plates and the chassis will last a lot longer so we also had fixed toe-in plates on this car and with only vertical adjustment just to make it easier so this is three degrees one two three easy to tell less adjustment holes really everywhere compared to the old car the black edition is all about stable yet fast invisible speed that's the key <laughs> i couldn't even remember this but that's kind of when the whole invisible speed was a thing so back when the black edition was released we were talking about invisible speed i helped jq because i love how mad people get when he beats them that was another degani quote okay where do we go from here so when the black edition hit the market it was a big step forward and for me it was a big step forward because i began to sort of feel some pride again in my car because in the very early days i was proud because i had achieved it like fuck i made my own car that's crazy but then all the issues and i wasn't really happy with the performance and kept developing it and everything proved to be a lot harder than i thought so it i kind of i lost that sense of like pride like wow we really made a good thing here but everything else about the brand was going really well like the brand image and everything we were doing sort of creating a splash in the industry that was nice so videos and websites and race presents and then later on like press conferences at the world's 2014 and and uh the team presents with tents and shirts and all of this stuff and outside sponsors we have skull candy and then armor energy buying the van in america and wrapping the van and uh same thing in europe and the road trips and uh traveling around south america hooking up with keenan and all that all like everything that was going on was just and the asia tour we did back in 2013 all of that stuff was great but then like the core thing that i really loved and that I was truly passionate about the product itself, the car itself, it was kind of lagging behind a bit. And I wasn't happy about that. When the Black Edition was released, I was happy because I, f I had that feeling again where the car was better than me. And that's important for me because I knew that the car isn't limiting me in any way. It, the performance of the Black Edition was high enough to where I, I could sense that when I get the when I do everything right, I get the setup good. I drive to the best of my ability. I am holding back my results. You know, the car can do more than what I'm capable of doing. That's a great feeling to have. So I, I was happy about that. And that only sort of strengthened that feeling strengthened the more the car developed. So from like 17, 18, 19. Like 17, I remember I did really well at the Euros in Sweden, uh, qualified seventh, made the main. I unfortunately bent a, a front center dog bone in the main early on, so that ruined my main. But that was a good race, and I had a few other good showings around that time too. Then uh, if we fast forward to today, it's going to be four years soon. So the Black Edition has been out for four years, and... Honestly, I feel like a lot of what I've learned now, a lot of the development has reached the point where we need a bigger change again. So we haven't actually had a lot of modifications do being done to the black edition because black don't crack, like they say. You know what they say. So four years, it's, it's really sort of a suitable time to make a bigger update, in my opinion, because... In that time, the first two years of a new platform, new car, new development, you need to figure out the setup. So you need to so sort of find the good basic setup and then the adjustments that work for each condition. And then you can make a few up option parts for that and you figure out the direction you want to go with the car. And then it, sometimes it's as simple as making a few new parts and boom, you're there and you've taken a step forward. Sometimes it requires a bigger change. So change to the sort of 
the backbone of the car, you know, gearboxes and arm holders and arms and bigger change like that. We haven't needed to make many changes at all because we've, we've been slowly improving the setup on the car and people have been really happy. They, they say that the car is very easy and stable for them. So what we did instead was I really wanted to figure out this. Maybe you've guessed the whole piv pivot ball versus C hub conversation we've been having on this channel. I wanted to learn about that. So I made these knuckles. I'll show you here. I made these new knuckles with a lot of inclination and then matched them with new C hubs with a lot of inclination and also I added longer holes for the upper link. Then I paired those with new rear hubs. So we only have the one hole here for the insert because we only use the long arm in the rear. And then also I eliminated the short hole here. We only have, this is the, well, basically this, hole, this short hole here is the same as the longest hole on the old hub. And then we have one even longer one. So let me just find a hub for you. So our hub used to look like this. We used to have two holes there for the arm and then three columns for the upper link. So we changed that now on the black edition or the new parts, 2020 parts, the longest link hole here is the short one on the new hub. So a big change there. So what was the idea of these parts? Well, the feedback for these parts has been really good. People have liked the inclination C hub and uh, knuckle combination because it gives the car sort of that calm and stable pivot ball feel where that front end is super smooth going into a corner and it's just sort of more calm and less grabby. The problem with this though was that there was this tendency mid corner to oversteer a bit. So off power. So you'd go in nice and smooth, but then sort of in the corner, it would spin out if the, if there was dust in the corner or if you entered it maybe a bit too aggressively. So the standard parts were aggressive off center initially, but then once you turned into the corner, it pushed a bit. So it, it felt safe, but these parts, it was very smooth initially, but then when you got in the corner, you, there was a larger risk of the car wanting to spin out. So when you combine that with the new rear hub, where you can go to a longer link, that long link really locked in the rear end where it didn't want to do that. And also we released CVDs. So th these rear hubs, you can run the universals or you can run the CVDs. When you run the CVD, the rear grip is even more consistent. So there's even less chance of you losing the rear end. So this um, option part setup, so it's the 2020 option kit for Black Edition by JQ Racing, JQS 2020. The parts are also available separately. So you don't have to buy the whole kit. You can, you can buy the, each part separately. This has been really popular. You can go on the JQ Racing Facebook pages and ask people and they will let you know what they think. I have still tended to run, I run the rear hubs, but I run them with universals. And mostly I've been running the zero inclination hubs and knuckles, but I do understand why most people prefer these. I just like the feel of the zero inclination because I like the responsive steering. So the only place I would run these really is sort of a super high grip edgy track where I need that smoothness. But well, in Finland, we don't really have that. So, so this is really the only major update we've had for the black edition all this time. Okay. So let's, let's talk a bit about setup, I guess. I think that would make sense, right? So if we go on that JQ website, so the stories.jqracing.com and we go to the setup sheets section, we have a bunch of setups for the black edition. And also here on the right, we have some uh, good advice. So a setup guide for the black edition, for example. So if we check here, we see there's a lot of information about the car. There's these sheets that Scott Walker made that are really helpful. There's all the option parts that we run. 
then explaining the difference between the knuckles, the plates for the steering, uh, emulsion shock caps, the toe-in on the rear. Um, yeah, so really, really good and helpful setup sheets. Or not really setup sheets, sort of setup advice sheets. Then we have a bunch of text explaining all the different settings on the car, upper links, sway bars, down travel, front end settings. Uh, this is old, so this is something you don't need to do anymore, but originally we needed to dremel the front arm for clearance, but now it's done at the factory. Rear end setup explaining this. Well, this isn't relevant anymore because we updated the hub and we don't run the short arm anymore. We only run the long one and now we only have the longest hole and one longer. So a lot of information, explanation of the towing blocks here. This is an option part. This is the same as the white edition, but we use this when we use 1.5 degrees towing. So standard is three. We have a 2.5 one also, but we like to run the 1.5 tow a lot so that we use the white edition block. So here's an, an image to show you how those work. Suspension, we talk about shock settings, diff settings, recommended option parts, um, high, high versus low grip track setup information, gearing explained because we have optional gearing for the car, shock bladders, emulsion, and then sort of a brainstorming section with ideas. If, if you need something particular from the car, then what could you change? So there's a lot of information here on this website. I think it's underutilized actually. People don't really go on here and check. And we also have it in German and French. So a lot of Frenchies don't speak English and a lot of Germans don't speak English. So we have this translated into French and German. So maybe a lot of you didn't know that. Actually, I think we might have it in uh, Spanish too. Let's see. Did you know this? We have a whole website in Spanish. Did you know that? Did you not know that? I can't even find uh, things here. The Negra, the black edition. Oh, yeah, here we go. See? Same information in Spanish. I need to add that link on the other website, don't I? So we have the information here in Spanish. No excuses, man. Okay, let's go and look at some setup sheets. Actually, before that, let's go and look at some video of the Black Edition doing some laps. And then we talk about what setups we use. And I'll show you parts of the video to, re to explain better how they help. Actually, no. Let's, let's... <sighs> okay, listen. I had to add this in the video. I was editing this and I noticed that, man, I was rambling all over the shop. So there's a solution though. Go to invisiblespeed.net and we just released the new book, The Guide 2.0. Basically, read that book and you'll understand what I was trying to explain in this video. Also, I mean, for the, if you don't want to buy the book, if you don't want to get the book, just get the downloadable material because in there, you'll find setup advice in sort of short form. Just if you want this, do that. Or my car has this issue that I want to solve. Okay, solve it by doing that. And we'll also include the specific advice for the Black Edition. Actually, that file could be more valuable than this video. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm still just mind blown that I can't get the information out to you in a sensible way way but anyway so invisiblespeed.net check it out and the downloadable files will be working on them in the coming weeks to really try to perfect them and once you get them you have access to all the updates for the next year so it's a no-brainer it's like 10 euros to get them so look into that thank you let's talk about the negative stuff first before we go and watch laps and talk about setup, let's talk about all the negative stuff. Of course, no car is perfect. And the Black Edition 
isn't perfect either. So I made a bit of a list of all the feedback that we got, like the bad stuff. So there are two different kinds of problems. Um, one problem is when you have a batch of something that, or you have sort of a short time in history when something is bad, but then because the, the parts are in circulation, it becomes a longer problem. So originally we had the bad plastics. Now it didn't last for a long time, but people had a bad experience and that lasted for years. I mean, maybe even today, until today, there are people who think that the plastics on the JQ are bad. Just because the first batch of plastics were terrible and broke, especially in cold weather. That's not the case anymore. We, we don't have that issue. Like, it's just not a problem. So some, sometimes there are things that people have an opinion about something based on the past and that's been fixed. So the plastics is one of them. Also the sort of modification thing where people feel that you have to dremel this and dremel that. It's not really the case. Yes, there was a moment there where we all did it, but now it's done at the factory and you don't need to dremel anything really on the car to get it to work. So what we do is we cut the front chassis tabs off because we don't need them or we don't want them. We don't want them there to dig into the ground or collect dirt or anything. So we just cut them off. But it's not something you have to do. That You get the right amount of droop even with them. So you don't have to dremel anything anymore, but people still have that feeling like, oh, we need to do all these modifications. You don't really. It's not something you have to do. If you look at other brands too, the top drivers tend to modify a lot of stuff like Tebow dremels half of his front end on the Techno off and Mayfield runs MBX7 arms on his 8. And like there's always this mixing and matching and modifying and that's normal. So even if we were still dremeling it, I wouldn't see it as sort of a major issue if you can have a good setup as standard. Okay, so th th those things are sort of non-issues in my opinion, even though some people complain. But then there are some legit issues too. So in the last year or two, we've had soft turnbuckles. So we had a batch of turnbuckles, which I think it was the infamous recycled chewing gum again that they used instead of steel. So they just bent way too easily. And I think they used that same material then on the um, outdrives because we had a batch of diff outdrives that just wore out super quickly. So that was worrying, but it's, it seems to be fixed now. So yeah, we had the turnbuckles and the outdrives, soft, no good. N not a fan of that, wasn't very happy, t I can tell you that. Uh, then people complain about the shock shafts, that the shock, so shock shafts are too soft. And they are maybe a bit soft, but I mean, I race them. I, I don't run another brand or anything. I race the standard shock shafts in my car. I haven't had them bend in any sort of significant race that I can remember. Have I bent them? Yes, I have. Is it something I bent all the, bend all the time? No. But I have heard from a number of customers that it's an issue. And I agree, we need harder shock shafts. But is it like a game changer? Like, oh, it's terrible. They keep on bending every run? No, it's not that bad. You can run the stock ones or you can replace them with another brand. You can bend any brand shock shaft. Uh, do these bend too easily? Maybe yes. Maybe, maybe they do bend too easily. But is it sort of, is it a big enough issue to where you wouldn't want to run the car because of this? I don't think it's that big of an issue. We're going to have to improve them. Screws. So there was a moment there where we had bad screws. They, they were using these screws. You could tell when you look on the end of them, they had a 12.9, but it was... It wasn't the 12.9 that we've seen on other brands, that's for sure, because that head's sheared off. So no more 12.9. So even today, I just make sure when I build my kit that there are no 12.9 screws in there. But in general, just the screw quality, it just has been, it hasn't been good enough. It's fluctuated a lot. We All screws in the kit aren't the same. Like it's just, it's been a mess. So that's also something, the hard way in the, in the kit needs to be better. And also with that, there's been the problem where, if I have a rear diff here, I'll show you. Okay, this seems to be a good one. The screws on the rear diff, this is a good one, but on some they protrude a bit to where 
the diff pinion will clip the screw. So you, when you turn, when you turn the drivetrain when it's new, there's this click in the rear gearbox because the pinion is just barely hitting the screw, and that's because some of the screws, the head is a bit thick, so it doesn't go all the way in to the countersunk, countersunk portion in the gear, and then it protrudes and uh, the diff pinion can hit it. So again, I mean, if if you have the right screws there, shallow with a shallow uh, countersunk head, it's not a problem. If you get the thick ones, then they hit the pinion. Now me, sometimes I'm just lazy and I just run it. You run it and it goes away. Well, yeah, of course it's better change the screws or Dremel the screws so it doesn't hit. But then again, sort of a unnecessary and silly annoying thing to deal with and again it's supposed to be a high quality car so you shouldn't have these kind of issues so where are we at so that sort of batch problem turnbuckle outdrive they haven't normally been issues especially the drivetrain has been super good and lasted a long time it's one of been one of the best things about the car to be honest how long the gears last and the drive shafts and outdrives it's been super solid except for this one batch of outdrives and then the hardware yeah we definitely need to improve on that and uh, the shock shafts we need to make them harder also in the past we had a problem where the hex pins snapped but that hasn't been a problem anymore so they they've been good uh, yeah the rear diff screw like I expla explained an annoying thing that will be solved when the hardware issue is solved and you have all the right screws in the car then on the front of the car if we look at the front uh, the, the sway bar the anti-roll bar here is very close to the drive shaft and so when the suspension compresses it actually touches the drive shaft there so now less than optimal again um, not very optimized x-ray wouldn't be happy about this well, what I've done is I 3D print a gearbox half for myself where the sway bar position is raised. Now, I can tell you that 98% of people out there won't notice a difference either way. But having said that, of course, it's not ideal to have the sway bar rub on the drive shaft when the suspension is compressed. So again, just a sort of small annoying issue that shouldn't, that shouldn't exist, basically. Even, even though you won't tell the difference, you can see it and it's annoying and it should be better. So what can be done even with stock parts is if you get uh, shock, shock ends and you cut them. So if you have shock ends, if you cut it right at the base of this triangle here. So you cut two of them and you use a grub screw to connect them. You can make a longer uh, sway bar rod, sway bar link. And then it will raise the sway bar here to where it doesn't hit the drive shaft anymore. So that's one solution you can do. Those, those are, I think, really the main issues that people have had with the car and the main complaints. Then there are some things that we just do to improve it. So for example, the servo saver, we don't really use it anymore. What we do is we use the CNC top part and then I, you can either use shugu or some sort of suitable glue or silicon. And what you do is, let's see if there's a different picture. So what you do is you put, you put the glue all on the sort of aluminum cylinder. Then you put this first plastic part on and then you put the CNC servo top on. And all those three, those three parts are glued together. Then you put the spring on and you tighten the nut all the way down so it's solid. And then what you can also do is put the zip tie here around the whole thing so that this part can't flex. So then you have a solid servo saver. Basically you don't, don't have a servo saver anymore. So this lower part, the CNC top and the cylinder are glued together and the spring is tightened all the way down and then zip tie around here. And the fact that it's solid improves steering response and uh, also the steering at sort of full lock because the tires aren't allowed to flex back anymore. 
so the steering can't sort of straighten out and this is especially apparent um, in hot weather and on high grip so this is really something we noticed and I've been doing this now for two years and I haven't had an issue there's enough flex elsewhere so there's enough fle flex in the radio tray and servo attachment and everywhere to where that gives enough for the servo I haven't had any servo issues servos breaking it's all been okay so yeah, I, that's something I do recommend that you do. Just eliminate the servo saver, basically. And, and do run the CNC servo saver top, the option part. So those are, now we've sort of covered all the negative stuff, the bad stuff. You know, I have to bring it up, right? It wouldn't be right if I say that everything's perfect with the car. It's not, but I know that the car itself, the car is capable. I think, see, this is the funny thing. It's all about perception, isn't it? It's the important thing isn't always the truth. <laughs> the important thing is what people think is true. So the perception people have. And the big thing about perception is also the fact that we have, we've never had a top professional driver. So the fact that we don't have a world championship and European championship and TQ at DNC and all of this like we don't have a driver like that winning big races it it means that there's a, so, a certain sort of lack of credibility around the car so people don't think it is good enough or as good as others but there are other brands that I mean HB have pins coming out of the flywheel and Associated had the same problem at one point and some cars wear out super quick uh some the design is even older than this you know as far as the gearboxes and hinge pins and uh, a diff access and all that but those people running that they don't seem to really have an issue with it i guess because they have top pros who are proving to them that the car is good winning big races and that so i've always found that interesting to wear credibility and perception is key really but anyway that's i don't know that's just a side note it's not an excuse i'm not trying to say that the issues we have aren't real or that they aren't important i'm just pointing out that all brands have them okay so let's go and look at a lap with the black edition and then talk setup here we go Uh, this is my home track. It looks like a construction site, but it's a cool track. The video doesn't really do justice to how rough it was, but... Big bump there, for example. Can't really see. Okay, so let's let's go and look at the setup sheet and then we can reference this video. Okay, so this is the standard setup that we recommend. Starting setup, average Joe. And see, the starting setup hasn't changed since December 2017. It's that solid. We can also then look at my latest setup here from the Finnish Nationals in Vasa. How it's different and why it's different. Okay, where do we start? Let's start with arm position. No, let's start with ride height. So typically 27 front and rear to like I ran here, 25 front, 27 rear. That is pretty good. That's basically what I run always. 25 to 27 in the front, just about always 27 in the rear. Works good everywhere. Why is the front lower than the rear? I think that's just the best balance for the car. That's how it wants to drive. If you raise the front ride height more, it just feels that the front end is too high all the time. So 25, 27, 27, 27, that's where we are. Down travel, 102 front, 122 rear. That's the standard. I have actually increased it recently. So we've been running more, a longer shock length in the front 
and it works out to be a bit more down travel too but see the standard setting has the shock in the middle hole and I'm running the shock in the outer hole on the arm. Now both are good and the standard setting with the shock in the middle and 102 that's fine and you don't need to dremel anything or do anything special you can run it like this. So let's stick to this first and then at the end we talk about my setup. Um, this is basically maximum droop in the front and rear is limited a bit you can go more. Sway bars 2.3 front 2.5 rear it's a good starting point I typically tend to go one step harder on, on the rear but here it was a loose track so I actually went one thinner on the front and stock on the rear. Many times I run 2.3 front, 2.6 rear. So I went one step softer here, 2.2 front, 2.5 rear. These lengths are really important actually. So the way to set camber and your toe, front toe, is to measure the links. So measure the distance between the links. This is a much better way, I think, than measuring the camber here. Because if five different people measure camber with a camber gauge, they'll probably get five different results. But if five people measure this distance, they can all get the same result. So to keep it sort of consistent, we, we like to measure the gap here between the links, and that's how we set camber. So the distance here is the precise measurement, and this is sort of uh, estimation. So that it's half a degree to one degree, 1 1.5 to two degrees, you get the point. Um, arm holders middle everywhere so the stock setup is good because you can adjust it either in either direction and that's a good thing Ackerman we run in the front hole and we run the stock black edition number one uh, steering plate upper link is always long top on this hub and middle on the tower never really change this to be honest the upper link just run it like that 19 degree well this was also a mistake it's supposed to be 18 so it's 18 degrees um, we never run the 15 so we go between 18 and 20 now that's what we do shock positions we would run I think mostly run hole 2 or hole 3 here and on the arm middle is standard but I run outside we're going to talk about that when we look at my setup hex is a very powerful tuning aid so stock hexes will be a bit looser good for bumpy tracks good for edgy tracks if you want more grip you go to the wider hex plus one on the front you'll have more steering into corners plus one on the rear you'll have more rear grip so plus one all round for more traction so that tends to be one of the first things that people like to change rear toe in we have a few different options but three degrees or 3.25 is really good if you're running these uh, fixed towing blocks and then with the white edition towing block then we use 1.5 uh, to go to the minimum amount of towing so either run 3 or 3.25 or 1.5 that's my recommendation shock positions on the rear same thing really 2 or 3 mostly I would run 3 on the arm basically always run the middle hole on the arm always run the long arm on the hub well, so the old old style hub always run the longest hole. The lower hole, low on the hub and low on the tower for low grip. And then up on the hub and, well, actually the standard setup here is middle on the tower and low on the hub. That's like the safest, most stable setting. But not really something we change too much, to be honest. Find what you like and then you raise the whole link on the high grip, lower the whole link on low grip uh, hub position one shim in front three behind most of the time that's going to be the most grip on high grip tracks really bumpy tracks we could move one step back so uh, two shims in front and two shims behind is that how it works yeah that's how it works something to note if you change to 1.5 degrees toe in in the rear then you need to move the hub one step further forward than you normally run so if you have your hub here with one shim in front three behind and you go from three degrees to 1.5 degrees then you need to move the hub all the way forward so no shims in front 
and four shims behind. That's because as you, as you reduce the towing, you are lengthening the wheelbase also. So you reduce towing a lot, you need to move the hub back to make up for that. That's so you still have the same drive shaft angle and wheelbase. So that's important to know. Going from 3 to 1.5 degrees, you move the hub forward 2 mil, so one shim. The hub towing, also often overlooked, but a very good setting. So this really eliminates any issues you have with a rear end that feels loose. So if you go to plus 0 0.5, so the plus is always towards the inside of the car. So looking from the rear like this, you would take this insert and you put it here. So the plus would be to the inside. That means you are adding toe in. So 0 0.5 is the middle setting and then one degree is maximum locked in, maximum rear grip setting. So the standard setup has plus one, uh, the lowest axle height. So the upper hole in the hub lowers the hub as much as possible, lowers the axle height, the distance between the drive shaft and the hinge pin here. And that gives the car the most traction when you accelerate. So that's why we have this set up as the standard setting. So this just makes it easy to drive. And that's what this setup sheet is attempting to do. So for the widest variety of tracks, we want to make the car neutral and easy to drive. And that's really the feedback we also get uh, from drivers. They say that the Black Edition is very easy to drive. Very stable, very easy to drive. So that's a good thing. Okay, then we look at the diffs. So 10,000 in the front, six center and four rear. So stable, easy diff setup. Uh, we have the 4514 gearing, which is the even smoother gearing, and it just makes for smooth acceleration and the car maintains a, a lot of traction when it accelerates. For shocks, the standard pistons are 7.1.2, 7.1.4, but just about everyone drills these out. So we have 7.25 in the front, 7.135 in the rear. Now, it sounds crazy that it's 1.2 and we run 1.25 because it's such a tiny difference, but it really makes a difference on the track. These are fine. These will work, but I do recommend that you give the 1.25, 1.35 uh, a try. That's sort of been a very common basic setup that people have run. And the gray springs, um, we'll talk about springs soon when we go over my setup, but the gray springs we mainly use on loose tracks. So if you, and also sort of loose and low speed track. So if you're on a high grip track or very high speed track, or even a track with very big jumps and landings, then they will probably be too soft. We do have a black JQ spring, but we found that the Mugen springs are actually better. So the Mugen 9.0 front and 10.75 rear. That's what we've been using. And that's, those have been good. So I go between JQ gray and then the Mugen 9.0 front, 10.75 rear. And we do have a, a new range of spring co springs coming. I'm not sure when they're going to be ready, but they are coming, so. But for now, those springs that I mentioned. We have these sort of high arm holders and low arm holders, but we always use the low low ones, so this is really unnecessary in a sense. Okay, let's check the notes. Oh shit, was I was I covering the diff wells with my image here? I think so. <laughs> oh, oops. Well, you get the idea. Here's the diff wells that we run. Okay, let's look at, ah, oh, before the notes, uh, weight distribution. So the standard setting has it. So this arrow is front. So this is front. So the arrow is pointing backwards and we use the front holes for the engine. That's the standard setup. Now this will make the car a bit more stable and sort of less responsive and less agile. What I do is I always run it so that the arrows point forward and I have the engine in the front holes. So this, this means that 
the engine is two mil further forward. So the weight is further forward. I have more weight on the front end. So the car turns more in hairpins and tight corners. And I get around those corners more quickly. But the car is also more responsive. So that's why the standard setting has the arrows pointing backwards using the forward holes. So the engine is a bit further back and uh, it just makes the car more stable. So let's read the notes. Long links. Okay, thicker rear. Long links means that in the past we used to have a standard setup which we ran short links on and then we updated it to long links because the longer links just made the car more stable again. So it wasn't as responsive and it, it was just easier to drive with the longer links. So long links, thicker rear diff. Um, we also added, I think we had 3000 before we went up to 4000 because the slightly thicker rear diff helped to lock in the rear end going into uh, corners. And I just explained the motor one step back from full front, um, to, again, to make the car more stable. And then the recommended option parts is, so the CNC servo saver top, that I mentioned, we have it in black or gold. And then also the high wing mount. So the either black or gold CNC high wing mount. The, when you raise the wing, it also again, just makes the car more stable. And funnily, funnily enough, everywhere, high speed, low speed, just everywhere. So what I think happens is in the air and at high speed, the, the wing is higher up in cleaner air. So that it does create more downforce and stability, but also what happens is the weight of the wing is higher. So the weight of the wing helps to roll the car in the tight corners. That also gives it this sort of softness and grip in those situations. So it just feels more stable with the high wing mount. So we, so we do, do recommend that. And I, I have been running now the HB wing mount, the high HB wing mount. And I did that because I wanted to make a car that was as light as possible and the HB wing mount was lighter than the stock one. So that's why I did this, but it's lower. So I 3d printed some risers to get the wing height back, but it's, this isn't something that is necessary. And I don't think you will notice a difference if you go to the HB wing mount. As I say, I did it because I changed everything I could think of on the car just to make a lightweight car. So if you aren't doing that, then there's no need really to, to put the HP wing mount on. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be a big difference in handling. I don't know if you'll notice anything to be honest. Okay, so that plus one hexes, uh, one millimeter front and rear. And for high grip tracks, raise rear link inside and outside, like I explained. And what else? Uh, go to a thicker rear sway bar. Yes. So that's true. I also said that I tend to run the 2.6 in the rear most of the time. You can also raise the rear hub. So the middle insert. So you would go to this one in that case here, the middle insert for smooth high grip tracks, put one insert for more anti-squat. Okay. So then I'm talking about this. I would go here, increase anti-squat. And yeah, the latest shock setup that I already explained and try thicker diffs if you want more drive. So this 1064 is a very easy setup. And then a setup for more drive is 12155. But I think recently we've actually been running 1225, not 15 in the middle. Okay, so let's look at the setup I run. And then let's look at the video also. And we'll go over some reasons for the changes that I make. Um, let's start with the steering feel. We went over the stock setup now, which was really stable. It's really makes the car easy to drive where you have uh, the, the plate here, you have the number one plate for the, actually this will be easier to look on the pictures. So the standard setting is very stable. It makes the car really easy to drive. So it's, smooth going into the corner. Uh, then when you get on power, the rear grips well, there's a slight push. We just want to make the car as stable as possible. So here we use the number one plate for steering. It's the long one. We have a inclination on the knuckle. 
make it, both those things make it smooth going in the corner. Yeah, we have that middle hole in the arm for the shock. And then let's look what I changed there. So I use the number two plate on the knuckle instead of the number one. And the reason I do that is that I get a lot more steering. So for example, this corner coming up after the double, this corner, it's kind of hard to get the car turned. The car, it's very common that the car pushes in this corner and the, that number two plate really helps the car turn there. Another corner where that number two plate is really good. If we fast forward a bit. Is this right hander here? Right here, the car likes to push, but when you put the number two plate on, the car rotates much more in this corner. Same, this corner coming up here. Normally, the car wants to push here, but with the number two plate, you can get around this corner much easily, easier. The downside is that going into corners like, um, Let's say like even a section like this, like you turn right first and you turn left here. It's just more aggressive initially. Or even at the end of the straight, turning in at the end of the straight, the number two plate will be more aggressive initially. So that's the downside to it. But the gains you make in the tight corners is enough to where I almost always run the number two plate. I also use the zero KPI. So the zero KPI to me, it just makes it easier for me to control the car mid corner. So for example, this right hander coming up here, it's sort of off camber a bit and there's always ruts and bumps in it. And sometimes it's dusty and you really need a good feeling going into that corner, then getting on power and accel accelerating down the hill to the next corner and then that corner you want to carry speed and drive up the hill and for me it's just easier to connect the dots in a sec in a section like this with zero kpi so that's really why i i run it now over here high speed going into this drop off Having that inclination would actually be better because the car would be smoother in this section and through this drop off section. But I prefer the feeling I have with the zero inclination on other sections of the track. So both are good. It's, it's more of a preference thing. Okay. So then let's see. I also lay down my shock one hole compared to the standard setup and I go out on the arm. Now, there are two different ways of going out on the arm. The way I do it is I run an emulsion shock, so no bladder in the cap, and I run a longer shock shaft. So I run the old white edition uh, front shock shaft, JQB0058. Actually, yellow edition rear shock shaft, not white edition. So this shock shaft is longer and that's what I run in the front. And because I don't run a bladder in the cap, the shock shaft on full compression, the nut goes into the cap a bit, but there's no bladder there. So it doesn't matter. Um, with this longer shock shaft, then you have enough droop to run the outside hole on the arm. So why do I run this? I run this because then the front end offers more support for the car. So again, if we go back to the video, and we go back here, this long corner. This is the kind of section where also down here actually. So going into this next left hander, you can just enter more aggressively and the front end will support the car better. So throughout this left hander, like really threw it in and there's even a big bump here where I paused it and the, you can carry more speed through this section. And then also that next le long left hander where the speed kind of here in the middle, 
where you have to turn tighter and the sp you have to lower your speed a bit also the weight is transferring to the front the front has more support for the car when you run the shock in the outside hole so i like it because of that so i can drive more aggressively and even here i enter the corner pretty hard and throw it in it just you can push the car harder i i think when you have the shock out so yeah so the longer shaft and then shock out on arm okay why do i lay it down here on the tower well i lay it down on the tower because on sections like this in the back here it makes the front end feel a bit smoother and softer and also i have more steering mid corner so for example now coming onto the straight i go in and then sort of this section of the corner coming onto the straight here i i'll have a better feeling with the steering so my car will feel um like it drives rounder in a sense how can i explain that it's just the mid corner steering is more comfortable and i have more of it so it's easier to enter the straight probably the same at the end of the straight too but i i wouldn't i i haven't thought about it i don't think i do it for the end of the straight more so those sections i showed you and actually it does help with steering also in in this corner for example where i said that sort of lacking steering so that's why i lay lay the front shock down one hole okay uh on the front for the camber okay this is now also a lot different to the standard setting as you see 15.5 to 22 and that's because i'm running hubs like this that have a longer hole now this is a bit of a sneaky part because these have inclination but i have this hub with no inclination so that's a cheater part those we don't have uh, available but so yeah so i'm running a longer link but zero inclination if you are running that longer link you will need to run this uh, hub with inclination but as i said most people that run a jq actually prefer these they like the hubs with inclination and uh, then running the link long okay where were we so yeah so what i was going to say is i run very little front camber basically it's about zero degrees i even marked here like zero to zero point five here and i do that because when you run very little front camber it makes the steering really smooth and it's sort of very consistently smooth steering so i like to run low amounts of camber because of that i tend to run the 18 degree c hub but i go between 18 and 20. on the front i go between stock and plus one the stock will be less steering so smoother steering if i need smoother steering i'll do that if i feel that the front is catching bumps in corners or sort of turning the car in a when i don't want to turn so catching bumps essentially then i'll go to the stock hex because the initial steering will be less and smoother and also the front end won't want to catch bumps as much so on edgy tracks the stock hex will be better definitely i tend to run the lowest insert on the front a and b block lowest because it reduces the chances of traction rolling or flipping over a lot so for example if we go back to the video here this section here it's very common for you to flip over actually in the video you can see another car flip over here because you want to enter fast here but it's quite rough and you're turning at the same time then you have a drop down while you're turning so this kind of section it's quite easy to flip over if you go too fast and here same thing actually in this corner and when you lower when you lower the arm on the inside on the front it helps to reduce the chance of flipping over so that's why i like to run it this way standard setting is zero because it's it's a more sort of universal setting i would say 
in the way that it is a, overall it's le a bit less steering the initial response is a bit more but it is less steering and we want to make the standard setting very easy for people so that's why we have it zero zero and then basically if you want if you have an issue with the car flipping over then you could lower it but yeah so i tend to start with it all the way down and what else about the front uh well bump steer so the bump steer you really would have to adjust if you adjust the upper link but i just about never change the position of the upper link i always keep it the same so in the notes here i wrote what i do i think yeah so three millimeter shim between inner steering ball and Ackerman plate. So I have short side up on both ends. So the inner and outer is in this posi position. The short side is up. And then on the inside, I have three mil shims, short side up. And that's, that sets the bump steer correctly. For bump steer, you really just want to minimize the bump steer. And then on compression, it, there is a slight amount of bump steer. So on compression, the tires toe out so that's how you set that uh down travel on the front we run a lot pretty much maximum i cut the tabs on the chassis yeah so these these tabs here i just cut them off so dremel cutting wheel straight there straight there no tabs so when you land jumps they don't dig into the ground that's basically why we do it um front toe out actually front toe out that's a good setting also so especially on higher grip if you shorten this steering link here to add some more front toe out it smooths out the steering a lot so if we imagine that this was a high grip track for example then if we had more toe out on the front this chicane here this whole sort of long corner that you're turning and then sweeping to the left and this long corner all these sections would be a lot easier to drive you'd have a bit less steering in these tight corners like there and there maybe even a bit less steering here but again this tricky section here much smoother there you saw that other car flipping it actually started crashing earlier it seemed it's rough like i said the video doesn't do this justice but um, yeah, so front toe out is a good setting. When the front feels a bit nervous or a bit off, like the steering response isn't quite right, what you really should adjust is front camber. Just adjust the camber slightly. Usually you go to a bit less camber if you want smoothness or a bit more camber if you want more steering and then uh, front toe out so more toe out if you want it to be smoother less toe out if you want to m want more steering more grip and that's often the only thing you need to do i know it sounds ridiculous but don't make big changes really people tend to make too big changes so you have the basic setting and then just play with the camber and toe out. And then, like I said, with the hex, edgy tracks, thin hex, loose tracks. Can be high grip tracks also if if uh, the front end feels smooth, then the plus one hex. But hex, adjust the hex, adjust the tie rods. Keep it simple, seriously. Okay, next thing, uh, sway bars. Okay, so I tend to run 2.2, 2.5 if it's very slippery track, maybe 2.2, 2.6 on most tracks or 2.3 2.6 that's really the um, anti-roll bar settings i use now thinner one on front if you need more steering so again if we go to the video um, these are really the corners where like i said this left hander here not so much here not so much here. This long corner, thicker rear sway bar is really good. There, this tight corner and this tight corner. This is where that thin front sway bar helps to turn the car. And uh, here also. 
here maybe these sort of longer corners the 2.3 would actually feel better probably but it's a balance thing you need to try to find the right balance for you here also maybe the 2.3 would actually find feel better but overall on this track also i think 2.2 is better and like i said this long corner when you have the thicker rear sway bar you can carry more speed because it supports the rear end more and the car remains more balanced through the corner so the high speed sections thick rear sway bar is good um, actually the low speed sections and tighter corners often the car will have more rotation with the thinner rear sway bar because it can sort of roll and help to rotate the car the, the harder rear sway bar often just makes it to where the rear end is stiff and doesn't allow the car to roll and rotate like this corner here for example that it it will kind of want to push here mid corner when you have a really thick rear sway bar the thinner sway bar actually you lower lower the speed of the car and it allows the car the rear of the car to roll and then turn so it's an in interesting thing actually the thick sway bar is better throughout this long section here but then you come to this tight corner and then a thinner sway bar would be better rear sway bar so it's again it's a question of balance also if you go too thick on the front sway bar then the problem is that the car will be too aggressive initially actually so all throughout these sections the initial steering would increase and it could be harder to drive so I tend to always run even on a very high grip track I tend to run maximum 2.4 front sway bar but almost always just the 2.3 I go between 2.1 2.2 2.3 that's the range I use because when I go thicker than that on the front sway bar the car becomes too nervous initially a rear I mostly run 2.6 we don't have a 2.7 I wish we did because I think the jump to 2.8 is too big so I run 2.6 mostly I would like a 2.7 many times but we don't have it so I stick with the 2.6 and then loose tracks I run a 2.5 so that's sway bars okay rear end so okay let's start with the shock because I just explained this with the sway bar about the tight corners and the same thing applies to the rear shock so if we go back here we're in the right section with the rear shock this long corner here when you stand it up in this halfway around the corner sort of when when you have to t turn tighter and you're still carrying a lot of speed the rear end has a tendency to sort of or that car has a tendency to collapse onto the rear end a bit now that slows you down and also can unsettle the car so when you stand the rear shock up the car doesn't want to do that it maintains speed more and it's easier to get through this corner but then you come to this tight corner and it the car doesn't want to turn now so it wants to push here so this is again a question of balance if you run the rear shock in the number three hole it's more sort of more stood up so it's better in that long corner it's better when you get on power it's better sort of everywhere where you're driving on power basically but then the tight corners the car will push a bit so then if you lay lay it down you'll have more steering in those sections so if i laid it down i would have more steering in this corner and then same in this corner I'd have more steering if I lay it down maybe this corner it would want to collapse a bit on the rear end accelerating here I, I couldn't square up and go as well in this corner and do this jump if I had the rear shocks laid over here it's pretty neutral but probably because this is a sort of tricky bumpy drop down section the laid over shocks would make it a bit smoother feel a bit smoother through here which could be good 
Not much difference through here, I think. Coming onto the straight again, because I'm accelerating hard here and turning. The stood up shocks will offer more support and uh, stability to the car. And especially if I hit a bump wrong or something happens to where the car wants to turn more, then it will sort of, it will manage it better with the stood up shocks. With the laid down shocks, maybe it would collapse on the rear end or want to oversteer a bit, you'd have to correct. So it could be trickier to get onto the straight with the laid down shocks on the, on the rear. Here laid down is good again because it helps to rotate the car in this corner. But then again, when, after you exit this corner, you want to navigate this chicane and go to this jump, carry your speed, the stood up shocks would be better. So right here in this corner, lay down would is, are better, but here not quite as stable as those stood up shocks would be for this fast right hander double jump landing continuing. So yeah, as you can see, it's, it's often a matter of, of uh, compromises, like which, which one do you choose? Okay, you choose the one that which is better in the low speed sections, and then you make some other adjustments to improve it in the other sections where the other setting would be better. So on the arm, yeah, like I said, always in the middle, never change that. Rear link, I think I remembered this wrong actually. So, because this is, th this is the same as the standard setup. Earlier I mentioned that I would run the lowest hole and low here. I, I actually remembered this wrong, so yes, this is right. So middle hole on the tower and lower hole on the hub. So I run the new hubs, but this hole is actually right. So I run the short hole on the new hubs, which is the longest hole on the old hubs. So loose track, I run the middle hole on the tower, lower hole on the hub. On the new hub, there are three holes vertically, so it's the middle of those three holes. And then on a high grip track, I would go to the top hole on the hub and the top hole on the tower. So that's how that goes. And I have the hub all the way forward, but I have the hub all the way forward because I'm running 1.5 towing. So I have zero towing in the hub top hole, so lowest axle height for most grip. And then I'm running um, the JQB0308, the white edition D block for 1.5 degree towing. So very little towing and uh, the hub all the way forward to compensate for that. Now the towing thing is interesting because I either run three degrees or 1.5. That's basically what I run. Now, on a track like this, I run 1.5 because this whole section, for example, here, I can just get the car to maintain so much more corner speed, so much easier. Here, the rear doesn't want to stick. I can slide a bit, get around the corner. Same thing here. You see, I slid a bit, but it was controlled. I can just flow around the track much better this way. And I can do it because the grip here is sort of quite consistent. It's sort of semi-loose, loose to medium traction. And it's good because I'm in control. It's consistent. I know what to expect. But there are tracks where it can be harder to achieve. I mean, well, even this track, I think, Well, this condition is, is, is one where it would be questionable if you want to run 1.5. So the problem with a track like this is you can see that there's the beginning of a sort of grippy groove for forming, but then outside the groove, there's dust. So it's an uneven grip condition. You see here, like there's a lot of dust right just outside the groove. So when you have this situation where you, you have a grippy groove and then dust outside of it, 
what happens is you go from the groove to the dust and when you don't have much toe in the rear might start sliding or stepping out and we don't want that so when that is a problem then it makes sense to run three degrees toe in so on inconsistent and uneven grip i run three degrees toe in but on tracks with consistent traction regardless of if it's high grip or low grip as long as the traction level is consistent then i run 1.5 degrees because it just helps the car maintain so much more corner speed so i have more steering and corner speed automatically but the rear end doesn't feel loose it still feels like it's gripping well like if we watch this video it doesn't look like the rear end is uh, loose and I'm running 1.5 toe in here so I can get on power hard and it's not stepping out it's gripping fine but it helps me so much especially in this section for example more steering easier to get through that chicane easier to get through this section much safer here it doesn't catch that bump there I can just power through this section smoother in this corner more steering there as you see when I get on power it, there's no fishtailing like I have grip going straight so I really like on c tracks with consistent grip I really like the 1.5 toe in and I almost never run um, to outboard toe in but I do recommend it for most people Mo it because it it just locks in the rear end so much more so Toe-in is something you should figure out for yourselves. Also, the layout does play a role. So many Amer American-style tracks, you have a lot of low-speed hairpins, accelerations, up to jumps. Like the track in this video is kind of flowing, fast and flowing. So on a flowing track like this, yeah, 1.5 is better. You go to Thunder Rally and some tricky layout. Yeah, maybe 3 is better because it just locks the rear end in so much more so you get around the corner you just punch it and you have good grip going up to the jump and you can jump precisely where you want so yeah this is just something you have to try for yourselves first of all try it to see how what you prefer do you like the outboard towing do you like it to be more locked in do you like 1.5 or 3 degrees and then also remember the layout depending on the layout and the track surface is it consistent grip or not that's how you choose what towing to run so consistent grip sweeping fast layout 1.5 towing lower speed us style layout three three degrees might be better uneven grip most of the time three degrees is better okay what's next axle height on the front the standard parts you can't adjust axle height with the option kit you can because we have thick bushings and thin bushing it works the same front and rear really on an edgy track high grip edgy track you would want to increase the axle height so you run the thick bushing on the bottom raise the knuckle you go to this middle setting from the top setting so let's go back to my setting here so on an edgy track i would go one or two steps up maybe just most of the time one step so I raise the axle height slightly on the rear and I probably wouldn't do anything on the link but on a really edgy track like DNC when it was at Fear Farm for example a really good setup there the track got rough and bumpy and then it was kind of inconsistently dry and uh, because the watering schedule was all over the place so you go middle insert so you raise the axle then you also go up here on the hub and you go up on the tower so this combination so you uh, are in the middle raise the axle height top hole on the hub and top hole on the tower it really helps to smooth out the rear end where it doesn't want to catch those bumps anymore so you have less side bite and it's really good for that and also if you're running the plus one hex maybe even go to the stock hex then so this is a really good setup for the rear end where it doesn't want to catch bumps so high axle height narrow hex 
high link on the tower and the hub. So this is for high grip and edgy track surface. And on the front for that same edgy situation, yeah, you raise the knuckle if you're running the 2020 parts and you run the narrow hex and you're already running the top hole, you're already running a long link. Maybe you could try the front link on the tower up one hole, but mostly I just run it in the middle here. But if you are running the uh, zero inserts in the front, go down, uh, one down at that point. So yeah, that's the edgy setup. And like I said, the, the standard setting is pretty much the setting you want for a loose track. So that's what you would run in that case. Rear arm height, this is, this is a good one. So here I'm running two degrees anti-squat. So when you run zero, zero, that is the same as one degree. So then if you go zero in the rear, 0.5 up, that's 1.5. If you go one up, that's two degrees. So now we're running two degrees anti-squat. So I was running 0.5 down and 0.5 up. So two degrees, but half a mil lower than uh, the highest setting. Standard is one degree. That's good everywhere. Why would you change from this? Now, if you're running on a smooth track, you can add anti-squat because anti-squat will help with initial grip, initial traction, initial acceleration. So you have more acceleration when you run more anti-squat. So that's good, but it's not as good in bumps. So for bumps, you run less. So that's why we have uh, one as standard because it's good on any condition. Okay, so then let's say we're on a loose track, loose rough track, what would you do? Well, you would go down just 0.5 makes a significant difference already. Going down 0.5 helps the rear end grip. So this section, you can't really see it, but it's very bumpy. So here, this corner, you, you can see that it's been raining and there's these grooves in the track from water flowing down. And this whole section everywhere, there's bumps. And if you have a high rear arm here, the gr rear grip will be inconsistent and it will be hard to navigate this section because of the rough loose surface. So when you lower it, also another thing is the car will naturally want to ride a bit higher. So you're not as confident throwing it into this corner. There's a bump here too. So you won't be as confident that you'll be able to get through this section. But when you lower the arm height, even just half a mil, you gain grip and you gain a sort of soft plushness, which gives you confidence to get through this corner. So watch here. <laughs> Boom, I just hit that bump in the corner and just went, sailed through. Do you see that? So if you're struggling in sections like that, then consider lowering the rear arm one step. Now, now we get to the next section. If this was higher grip, which is, it isn't now, but if it was, then this would be an issue for the lower arm because it's a long corner. You're really loading the car a lot here. And then here you're sort of, this is the sharpest point of the corner and you are accelerating. So there's a lot of weight going on the outside rear tire. This is where the rear end would collapse onto itself. And, and that's where the, if the grip was higher, the lower arm wouldn't be good. So a higher arm, would help the car maintain more speed there. Um, also, this section that we're coming up to here, this tricky section, if you're having trouble main maintaining rear grip here, going into the corner, dropping down, or the, throughout this section, a lower arm will make it so much more easy to get through this section because it will allow the rear end to grip, roll and grip and just be more forgiving. So the standard setting, like I said, was zero, zero. If you feel that the rear end is a bit stiff or you need more grip or the grip is somehow inconsistent, you can go just point, point 0.5 down, point 0.5 down. Or if it's a smooth track with high grip, um, smooth track with low grip and the rear feels a bit stiff, you could even go like this. So you keep the zero there and you go one down. So you are 
increasing anti-squat for more initial grip but also maintaining a low arm to allow it to roll and feel soft and plush in corners. So this is a very very powerful tuning aid but don't go overboard so just like I said standard is zero zero stay close to this high grip smooth okay one up front zero uh, rear low grip smooth maybe try this like I said so zero in the front one down in the rear most tracks you'll end up running something like this 0.5 down front and rear or zero standard setting so yeah play around th with this because it's a very powerful setting what's next uh, shocks okay pistons let's talk about pistons so there are two different piston settings that we tend to run now 7 1.25 front 7 1.35 rear standard was 1214 so we drill them out um, like I said we drill them out to 7 1 2 5 7 1 3 5 then the second piston setting we run is 5 1.5 front and rear now the difference between these two settings is that with the five hole piston and the bigger hole it makes the car more stable and calm so everything happens a bit slower it's not as responsive and it slows down the sort of bounciness of the car also so when would I run what on a high grip track or when I feel that the, my car is sort of edgy and nervous and responsive I would run the five hole piston also on loose tracks where I want the car to be more calm and I want to be able to drive the car harder I would run the five hole piston I would run the seven hole piston when I want the car to have a bit more grip and a more response and when the surface texture of the track is rough so the difference is that with that seven hole piston you can set the suspension to be softer so it's more plush it feels softer on the table also it drives very sort of soft and nice around the track and that rough surface so it has a bit more grip but then when you land jumps or hit a bigger bump it has more pack so the high speed versus low speed balance is good but on faster tracks higher grip tracks the car can be a bit too nervous and aggressive too much initial grip too much initial steering hard to control so then I would go to the five hole piston because it's more laid back easy going smooth and if the texture of the track isn't too rough then these are fine because with these pistons we run you know a thicker oil feel in in them so everything happens a bit slower with the car it has a bit less grip but it makes up for it because you can drive the car that much harder and it feels that much safer and this is a bit diff opposite to the other pistons because with these pistons less holes bigger holes you set the suspension up a bit thicker so it feels thick but then when you land or you hit big bumps it doesn't have too much pack now even though it's thick so many holes and smaller holes it feels softer yet it has enough pack and then fewer holes bigger holes it feels a bit thicker and slower uh, but then you would expect it maybe not to have enough pack but it ends up having enough pack that's the difference really so you play with those two pistons I would recommend that you try both and then understand when you want to use the seven hole and when you use the five hole these springs are actually I mentioned that we are making new springs so these are the prototype uh, not non-linear what's the word I'm looking for progressive the progressive springs we had control tire that's why I ran gridlock down travel so another thing that I adjust a lot is down travel but a very small amount the front tends to be 105 to 107 and rear is 121 to 124 mainly like 122 to 123 really the best way to explain this is that basically you start off with maximum droop do we have any pictures no 
no pictures of droop. Anyway, you start off with maximum droop and then you start reducing it front and rear. And you'd re reduce it until the car starts being worse. And the reason is that maximum droop is the easiest to drive, but when you release it, the, uh, reduce it, the car will become faster and faster. It will naturally carry more corner speed. So your lap times will be better. But at some point it gets harder to drive and a bit more inconsistent. You might sort of start spinning out mid corner or it's harder to connect the dots around the track. So you need to find that balance for yourself. And when you find that, then you know the range that you like to adjust the, the droop. So basically the car feels awesome and it's dialed. You reduce the droop a bit to go a bit faster or you're struggling a bit. The car feels a bit hard to drive. Okay, you increase the droop a bit to give you more time and the car more time to re react and respond to everything on the track. So it's sort of a speed setting and you have to find it for yourself. So, you know, without testing, even, you know, okay, I need to make my car a bit easier to drive on this track. Traction feels a bit inconsistent. Boom, you add some droop front and rear within your own ra range that you've found. So that's how I adjust droop. Uh, is there anything I've missed? Diffs. So diffs, this is a pretty good standard setting, 12.12.6. I could run this everywhere. I don't change the front diff too much because I don't feel that it makes a big difference. Again, I'm in the way here. Let's get me out. So um, I run 12 most, most places. Sometimes I would go 10. Um, maybe... If I need more steering, it's really a loose track, small track. Maybe I'd go 10, but most of the time 12, that's good. Maybe super hot weather, high grip track, big track. Maybe I go 15, but I almost always run 12. Center diff, I never really go below 10 in the, in the center. So maybe if I had trouble accelerating a rough loose track, maybe I'd go 10, but mostly I run 12. And if it's high grip, smooth, um, I can go thicker, 15, up to 20 even, and no problem. So if I go 20 in the center, maybe then I go 15 in the front. Rear diff, six is pretty good. I don't really go below six. Yeah, I, I don't really ever go thinner than that. I like six because it's so safe going in. If you go thinner, you have more steering into the corner, but then you run the risk of losing the rear end mid corner. So I like six because it's so safe entry to mid corner and it reduces that entry steering a bit. So I like that. And then accelerating out, you have good drive with six in the rear diff. So that's good on high grip or smooth tracks. I go even higher on the rear diff. So even you can go up to 12, even no problem if it's a sort of smooth high grip track. So yeah, so front 12 to 10 to 15, mostly 12 center. 10 to 20, mostly 12, rear 6 to 12, mostly 6. That's my diff setting. Is there any, I always run the arrows forward, engine all the way forward. I think I've covered everything now. Hopefully I've covered everything. I mean, I don't know. I feel like this video has been a super rambling video. I am not very sort of focused for some reason. <laughs> hope, hope, the, hope it makes sense on some level. What I've, okay, so let's con try to conclude this somehow. I think compared to the other cars on the market, where would I put this? So the black edition, I think it's somewhere between a Kyosho and an HB. Some, some, somewhere there. The, the sort of design philosophy, it's similar to that of the Kyosho, the MP9, I would say more so. so. So similar to the Kyosho MP9, similar to the HB. Compared to the Kyosho, you don't have to drive the black edition hard to get a good, really good lap time. It tends to be, the MP9 tends to be a car where it's super easy and calm and stable. And then to get the best lap time, you push and drive aggressively. Where the black edition, it tends to be a car where it feels good and stable, but then you push, you, it gets you a bit in trouble. Your best lap tends to be one where you calm down and really smoothly apply the throttle and steering and maintain your speed and do everything perfectly, calmly that's your best lap. So it's opposite in that sense. 
and then HB is kind of somewhere in the middle I, th I feel with that so but this this is uh, the black edition is sort of the same family of cars with those if that makes sense now what I like about the black edition is that you can run the same setup or very close to the same setup everywhere and the car will actually feel the same so I can go to a new track and immediately feel comfortable like I know what the car is doing and then I just make a few small adjustments and okay it's good I like that thing about the car it's good and bad though that small changes in setup make a significant difference for example you can be at the track and the rear end doesn't feel good you are like let's say let's show a bit of the video let's say for example you're at the track and then you land this double and you spin out here in that corner or that chicane is hard to do you really turn aggressively here and the rear spins out a bit it's it's hard to maintain rear grip here you don't really need to do anything else than just reduce rear camber a bit and that could give that could give you enough steering i mean enough steering that could give you enough rear grip to where it's not doing that anymore and you only reduced rear camber so the the f sort of minute small details of setup so front toe out front camber rear camber down travel the arm height like 0.5 millimeter of arm height that's really what you're playing with because that's how you dial in the car to your driving and the track conditions you don't want to make big changes you don't really change the camber links too much you you very rarely go more than one step on anything so it's a good and bad thing good because you can really notice the difference of the changes and you can make it perfect for you bad because the window of sort of really high performance is narrower than say the mp9 mp9 you can miss the setup by more and the feeling of the car will still be good maybe your lap time won't be as good but, but the feeling is good that's maybe the negative point of the black edition where when you go outside that window you'll notice like it gets a bit edgy you can sort of feel that it's not it, it's not as smooth now the car isn't exactly in tune with the track or your driving so that's something i want to improve for the future where I still have all the good things where you can drive your slowest lap in a sense where you do everything calmly and consistently and the lap time is really good you can still do that but the window for the setup the window for where the car is forgiving and easy to drive is wider so you don't have to be that precise with your camber and your down travel and all your settings so that's something I'm working on for the future what else is there something else did I miss something I'm sure I missed something we have maybe we have to do a part two comment below if you have any questions check out the website I'm gonna add the links to everything that we've talked about and looked at in the description so check the description for all the links you have the Spanish language French German and of course English so you have all that information hopefully you can make sense of this video I don't know it's ironic but maybe it's because i know the most about this car then i i i get mixed up in my head and i can't get the information out i don't know what's going on it's kind of ironic I, this should be the best video and i feel like it's almost the worst jesus super quick recap don't overdo it don't overdo your changes small changes stay close to the standard setup look at the average joe setup this is a setup for the most amount of rear traction and stability remember that tr the car needs to break in a brand new car run it for maybe two fuel bottles so what that one liter a quart a quart basically run it for a quart or two so everything breaks in redo your diffs redo your shocks make sure everything is correct measure everything precisely and then your car should be good the drivetrain needs to break in the pins and the out drives everything needs to break in so you have friction in the car and good grip so remember that 
And the only thing I would add on this setup is high wing mount, plus one hexes for more grip, and uh, maybe the Mugen Springs if these are too soft. That's it. And then compare this setup to the setup I have and uh, the things that I mentioned in this video. That really will get you, that will get you far already. And small changes, the best changes are this plate. Number one is the smoothest initially, but it can push mid corner. The number two plate, much more responsive steering, uh, much more steering in hairpins. Very good change to make. 2020 uh, C hub and knuckle, the inclined ones, very popular parts. I recommend you try these because again, they smooth out the initial steering a lot. So people really like how it's better in bumps, get better smoother into corners. Very good feedback for those parts. Okay, the, the new rear hub, it's not a must have because just run the long haul here. But if you're running the inclined knuckles here, it makes sense to get the new hub because you have an even longer link hole and that then adds rear grip and stability. And also you have the option of running the CVDs. When you run the CVDs, they have a bit less support on the rear end. So maybe stand up the rear shock one, go harder on the rear sway bar to compensate. But new front end part, new rear end with the long link, with the CVD, that's going to be the smoothest, most consistent grip the car will have with the least amount of steering into into the corner and that's people who have tried that have loved it hex with also very powerful tuning aid so on edgy tracks narrow hex loose tracks you need more grip wide hex toe in three degrees to lock in the rear grip on uneven traction consistent traction whether it's loose or high grip i prefer 1.5 try it for yourself um some people just like three always, but yeah, I run three on inconsistent tracks. So if the layout is such like often Thunder Alley layouts, three degrees is better. More flowing layouts, consistent grip, 1.5 is better. So try both. High wing mount, I recommend that. More stable, more grip. But other than that, I hope this video helps you out a bit. Ob obviously, I seem to be able to explain the handling of other cars than my own better i don't know why <laughs> i really this is mind-blowing to myself also yeah I, I don't know what to say like i i have mind pump i have serious mind pump right now i think we just have to end this video because this isn't going anywhere now i'm sorry <laughs> comment below if you have more questions i guess we have to make it do a part two in that case but I hopefully I covered the most important things. See you later.